Slovak's cinematic output. Slovak documentary filmmaking represented a significant portion of Slovakia's cinematic production during the medium's so far brief history in the Slovak land. With little surprise, the most prolific period of documentary output prior to the fall of communism in 1989 occurred during the flowering of Slovak film during the new wave of the 1960s through the late 19, uh, sorry, early 1970s. Although comparatively short-lived due to political pressures stemming from the normalization policy advocated by the so, uh, post-Soviet-led uh, so, post invasion-led government, uh, this era of Slovak filmmaking represents a rich and essential look into the discussion of an ethnic group's identity within a comparatively small, multi-ethnic state. As filmmaking, due to its high overhead and need for distribution, is an inherently political act in a nationalist system, I wish to use this paper to provide an overview of the historical background and external causes which led to this particular period of filmmaking. In addition, I wish to detail three phenomena which occurred in the realm of Slovak cinema in the 1960s and 70s, uh, specifically meaning documentary uh, cinema, although these traits also exist elsewhere. The role of documentary film as a means of clarifying and solidifying Slovakia's status as an exotic yet protected part of a multi-ethnic state during a time of ethnic strife, the aesthetic intersection of ethnographic photography and documentary film, and finally, the ability of documentary filmmaking to critique, critique existing power structures. Although Slovak cinematic output has been thoroughly dwarfed by the production of its largest neighbor and cousin, Czech cinema, it is nonetheless necessary to whittle the films discussed in this paper to a manageable size. This paper will concern itself, unfortunately, only with two of the era's most celebrated documentary directors, Martin Slivka and Dušan Hana who produced uh, documentary films which would become an emblematic of the Slovak lands. These films, I believe, represent an essential cross-section of the documentary output of the era, since the sample contains both an artistic iconoclast in constant trouble with the regime, and a successful content producer for the regime. I wish to begin our discussion with a simple question. Why was Slovak, as opposed to Czechoslovak documentary, such a pressing concern for filmmakers working in the Slovak lands in the 1960s and early 70s? The answer, I believe, lies in the political atmosphere broiling through Slovakia during this period. Although the 1960s brought increased freedom of expression and economic stability to uh, Czechoslovakia, the, reunific the reunification of the country following World War II had also exposed some jagged lacerations in the Czechoslovak national psyche, specifically regarding the nationalist passions that lurked behind the split in the first place. While the show trials and executions of Slovak resistance leaders deemed too nationalist by Moscow helped keep such tensions hidden during the 1950s, for much of the 1960s, Slovak directors, like the rest of the Slovak population, found themselves suddenly thrust into another round of ethnic and nationalist tensions. For directors, this led to concerted efforts towards re-establishing a space for Slovak cultural interests, a process many Slovaks felt familiar with after enduring centuries of attempts by outsiders to forcibly assimilate Slovaks into various other dominant ethnic or cultural groups, Hungarian, Czech, occasionally Polish, and Austrian. Historian Robert W. Dean notes that in the early 1960s, a common theme in the discourse between the Czech lands and Slovakia was the proper role of identification of ethnicity within the state of Czechoslovakia. Furthermore, Czech intellectuals and politicians reacted towards uh, concerned Slovak citizens with a lack of interest in Slovak problems which only encouraged nationalistic Slovaks to become increasingly intransigent. Ethnic boosterism became so prevalent at sporting events that officials began to voice concerns of a, quote, undesirable psychosis, even spite, which was sweeping throughout the country. As tempers flared, even Slovak Communist Party official slash decorated war hero slash national uprising leader, Gustav Husak, took to the press to advise the Slovaks to, quote, moderate the somewhat fiery and wild tendencies which can offend the Czechs. This discontent became increasingly obvious even to the most minimally informed outsiders. A National Geographic, hardly the bastion of uncompromising journalism, article from the February of 1968, mere months before the Warsaw Pact invasion of Czechoslovakia mentions that, the Slovaks still chafes under the Czechs' lingering view of him as a poor country 
These concerns were not only visible at sporting events and muttered over late glasses in pubs and taverns, but often reared their heads in cultural settings as well. The tempers that flare between Slovak sports fans and their Czech counterparts were evenly matched in cultural functions or even on the red carpets of film festivals. Slovak directors frequently found themselves in the middle of the cultural squabble, brawling intellectually with other directors in the newspapers, and in one highly publicized incident, uh, shouting in a group at a group of Czech directors at Cannes itself. As the main leader of this dis uh, disruption, Stanislav Bagarash, the, the culprit, uh, told his Czech counterpart, uh, the film critic Anthony Nim, one of the primary targets of Bagarash's wrath in 1968. Hey, hey, I was mad at you for two things. The first was this hyperopia towards Slovak cinematography. People so suffer from this very flaw where they have too many problems at home, and from this arises the problem where they have this sort of indulgent view of culture somewhere else. In this case, it manifested as some kind of con uh, condescending paternalism towards Slovak cinema, as if Slovak films were behind some sort of glass wall. Slovak identity and the construction of a space where Slovak identity couldn't exist thus became a matter of paramount importance. In order to pacify both sides and reduce tensions, it was imperative that not only was Slovakia's difference celebrated, but that it was seen as acceptable to celebrate it as a Czechoslovak, not as a Slovak nationalist. One of the ways that this could be accomplished, seemingly, was through encouraging Slovaks to produce documentary films financed by the cultural organs of Czechoslovakia. Slovaks, long accustomed to being the subject of colonial ethnography, as we documented, or preserved in amber for the consumption of expatriate Slovaks living abroad in the United States or elsewhere, could now celebrate Slovak identity and its place within the newly reconstructed Czechoslovakia in a manner best fitting a newly socialist nation on the road to communism. But what exactly was Slovak identity? The term Slovak has often had an elusive meaning, even for directors within Slovakia itself, uh, where Slovaks were inclined towards regionalism and infighting as much as anti-Czech sentiment. Adding to the difficulties faced by these documentary filmmakers tasked with creating competing visions of Slovak identity was the fact that many of their own ranks felt little esprit de corps. Fyodor Jakobinsko, arguably the most prolific and successful Slovak director of the last 50 years, has argued that he himself was more Czech than not, and only under pressure grudgingly admitted that he was at most an Eastern Slovak. At the other end of the country, Dusan Hanak, uh, from the western part of Slovakia, uh, in another conversation with Anthony and Niem, dated in 1969, vociferously denied both the connection with his fellow Slovak directors and the connection with the larger film, uh, Czech uh, film community at large. We are not away. I've already told you that, after all. In the Czech land, it's something else. There, those people go together. Although these two quotes reveal the incredible, uh, the incredible divide between Slovaks as to the nature of their identity, they also fundamentally underscore the need to create a unified front for Slovaks in, in the face of political and social insecurity during the 1960s and 70s. Although regionalist tensions were acceptable within Slovakia itself, no extant documentary exists that concerns itself with these mi uh, micro-regional insularities. Rather, Slovak documentaries from this period are always presented as examinations and explorations of a unified Slovakia, as if no difference existed between the Hungarian-speaking minorities in the South and the Rusin speakers in the Northeast. These documentaries, above all, concern themselves with an imagined Slovakia, one that may have had little to do with the actual linguistic and social realities on the ground, but were important for dealing with Slovakia in relation to a more powerful and established political state in the Czech land. When to face with diverse regionalism, perhaps the most logical approach for directors concerned with Slovakia identity was to return to a, uh, a trope, uh, which, was which was connected to a quasi-mythical past and thus could be shared by all Slovaks regardless of region or dialect. Perhaps the most well-known aspect of, the, of this particular notion of Slovakia is that Slovakia is a primarily agrarian realm, populated by shepherds and farmers in isolated villages. This stereotype, though popular, stands in direct contrast to the ever-historical awareness of the Czech land's political strength as the one-time head of the Holy Roman Empire and populous multicultural city. It is little wonder that perhaps the oldest thematic tropos in Slovak cinema, as it stands, is a celebration of traditional pastimes and handicrafts, uh, the pure vestiges of a lifelong forgotten by the Biedermeyer residents of 
the uh, celebration of traditional modes of living as a means to ethnic identity is in a, itself a fundamentally romantic position, connected with the national awakenings of the 19th century. In the early period of this romantic coming of age, the Slovak's closest neighbors, the Czechs, and the, the few Slovak intellectuals living in Vienna or Prague, concerned themselves with collecting legends and folk sayings from villages in an effort to retrace their ethnic roots. However, while Czechs spent much of the 19th century uh, engaged in the national revival, featuring, among other things, an emphasis on uh, traditional celebrations and pastimes before moving on to a more, uh, more modernist polyvalent identity, Slovaks were still struggling with the fundamental questions of identity and tradition well into the 20th century. When the Czechs had long lost interest in the documentation of obscure village folklore or embroidery patterns, Slovaks were still acumen actively documenting a way of life that had not yet passed from everyday into tradition. Ironically, in the realm of cinema and much of the realm of cinema, much of the early popularization of Slovakia as a documentary subject was driven by Czech and Hungarian directors and ethnographers. Uh, but none of these outsiders were concerned with Slovak culture, as concerned with Slovak culture, sorry, nor as influential on the Slovak filmmakers of the 1960s as Karol Pliska. Born in Vienna, raised in the Bohemian mining town of Česka Třebová, and madly in love with all things Slovak, Pliska had discovered a passion for Slovakia at an early age filming documentaries on Slovakia uh, for Czech production companies during much of the 1920s. Plitska's landmark documentary, Zem Spira, The Earth Sings, was completed in 1934 to widespread critical, critical acclaim as both an avant-garde cinematic celebration of Slovakia and as an ethnographic document. Uh, to, to put this in perspective, sorry, I accidentally just realized that my slides are a little out of order, so we'll, we'll think extemporaneously on the fly here. Uh, this is an excerpt from Karo Plitska's numerous uh, ethnographic photographs. In addition to being a director and a filmmaker, he was also a musicologist, a uh, folklorist, and really has spent perhaps the most time out of anyone not born in Slovakia in documenting Slovakia for reasons that seem to be mystical to some Slovaks. These are some stills from uh, Zen uh, Unfortunately, I don't have clips, and then the quality's not the greatest. But you can see the celebration, this idealized celebration traditional folk rituals, uh, some of which were actually not that traditional. More uh, folk pottery, et cetera. Oh, we'll still have time. The Austrian-born Czech director sought to preserve a mode of life extant in Slovakia, which had long ceased to exist in the Czech lands themselves, but which he believed still thrived in its own unique form in Slovakia. Plitska's, quote, home poem to Slovakia was wide, uh, uh, widely praised in both ethnographic and avant-garde circles. Um, as an ethnologist and photographer, Plitska's film displays clear links to the work of early documentary photographers like Pavel Sokhan, uh, who were similarly fascinated by Slovakia at the turn, in the turn of the 20th century. And perhaps even more importantly, Plitska's position as the first dean of FAMU, the Prague, uh, famous Prague film and television academy, led to a generation of interest in the proliferation of this particular style of folkloric documentary filmmaking. So of the two directors uh, I'm discussing here today, none is really more indisputably associated with Karl Plitzka than Martin Slitka. Uh, as a student of Plitzka's at FAMU, Slitka even wrote his bachelor's thesis on the work of Plitzka entitled Karl Plitzka, Photographer and Filmmaker. Uh, Slitka was also trained as an ethnologist focusing his doctoral work on Slovak folklore and folk culture. Slivka, like Hanak as well, belonged to an early generation of Slovak film students who received their training in Prague while retaining a laser-like focus on Slovak themes and tropes. Over the course of 30 years, Slivka produced over 45 documentary films, mostly short, uh, for Czechoslovak television and other film organs, on consistently Slovak themes, uh, with a slight foray into Balkan folklore during the turbulent years after the Prague Spring. These films, much like Plitska's, employ long, generally static shots to great effect, framing the image much like a photographer would. Uh, and to give you an idea of what I'm talking about here, uh, this is coming from Plitska's, uh, sorry, uh, Slitka's early, earliest film that I've been able to find. Uh, this is from 1960. Perhaps the single most stereotypical identifying characteristic of a Slovak film, documentary, or otherwise during the socialist years was a reliance on folkloric motifs and 
This particular fascination with folk culture is partly a socialist invention, however, as it draws on deep Slovak cultural roots reaching back to the, early, to the late 19th century and early 20th century. Illustrated ethnographic collections of Slovak folk costumes began appearing in Budapest and Vienna in the mid 19th century, while by the 1910s, Slovak amateur folklorists and ethnographers had adopted the camera as a major research tool. Uh, going back to our Pavel Sokan. Uh, amateur photographers such as Pavel Sokan embraced photography as a way of documenting indigenous practices in an effort to distinguish regions and establish a Slovak cultural identity in the face of oftentimes relentless Hungarian and Austro-Hungarian opposition. Photography's realism aided the attempts to brand Slovakia as an exotic land within the familiar confines of the empire, and later within the familiar confines of Czechoslovakia, adding an air of prestige to the strange southern cousin, much as Russian, the Russian Empire celebrated its own collection of diversity in the Caucasus and elsewhere in the empire in the early 20th century. The prevalence of interest in the trappings of, of folklore trappings of Slovak films in both the Czech and Slovak lands was at one point so prevalent that Czech film critic and dramaturg Jaroslav Bocek uh, vociferously complained that Slovak cinema watched over the adjective Slovak, caring much less about the noun cinema. No wonder there was such a rash of folklore, embroidered blouses, and national songs since Czech directors could hardly be expected to understand Slovakia as any different than the exotic, folklore, or the tourist land. Compounding Bolchek's irritation at the more stereotypical depictions of national identity is the fact that these same features, these folklore trappings, began to creep even into the work of the emerging directors, Slovak directors, to which the critic added, Slovak cinema saw its raison d'etre in its very existence. Such traits can be found in the beginnings of any cultural endeavor, however minor. Bocek's paternal dismissal of Slovak cinema was, was sadly not an isolated incident. So, despite the Czech dismissal of such films as bereft of artistic value, to quote Bocek once again, uh, Slipka's early documentaries revealed a surprising debt to the avant garde. Although uh, this is not quite visible in some of the stills I'm showing off, you'll have to just take my word for it for now. Uh, perhaps this is nowhere as apparent as in his 1963 documentary for Voda a Prata, Water and Labor, an examination of the traditional water power devices employed in rural Slovak villages. Here, static shots, heavily reminiscent of the ethnographic photography, appear juxtaposed with highly textural scenes of machinery and devices in motion. Although wordless, several semiotic clues help locate the film in Slovakia. The frequent appearance of mountains, for example, long associated with Slovak identity, the processing of materials uh, which are often deemed to be part of the Slovak portfolio of handicrafts, such as wood and wool, in the overall structure of Czechoslovakia, and the appearance of women wearing the traditional Slovak headscarf. Uh, and here you can see actually three of these elements combined in one. We see the, the babičky with their headscarves, um, already out of fashion in most the Czech Republic by the 19th century, um, working in a antiquated water-powered uh, mill for separating and combing and wool. In one particular, even the devices themselves often reference popular Slovak culture in cruel ways. In one particular shot of logs shooting down a water-powered delivery chute, it calls to mind a nearly identical scene in the Janosik film. Yura uh, Janosik, by the way, is a Slovak highwayman often claimed by the Poles as well, um, who was hanged for banditry in the 19th century, has gone on to become a folk hero and basically the most popular character in Slovak cinema. I think there's five Janosik movies to date now. Um, rumors are another one. I, I wish they would come to that. But, but anyway, uh, this is calling them a very nearly identical scene in two of the Janosik movies, where the Slovak bandit and his men employ a similar water slide to escape the pursuers in the mountains. Although these shots are often lyrical in nature, calling to mind the early days of Slovak ethnography, they're uh, combined with an atonal organ score uh, by Ilias Vilienka, refamiliarizing the folkloric aspects of the film while simultaneously proclaiming Slivka's sympathies with the new wave of experimental filmmaking coming out of Prague. The absence of a score which is more identifiably Slovak, again, represents the film's attempts to bridge two separate populations. While the imagery is iconically Slovak, the full cinematic experience of the film represents a further effort to expand the audience 
for more Czechoslovakian by recalling other experimental Czech filmmakers such as Verch, Kilo, and Jan Jemens. In Sika's later 1972 documentary, The Oldest Crafts, Nastasia Remesla, the focus again returns to traditional Slovak occupations and handicrafts such as pottery, shepherding, and wood carving. And this later documentary, Sika again reaches back to the earlier pastoral tradition established by photographers and ethnographers like Kutska and Sokan. However, while traditionally more traditionally shot than water and, and labor, with traditional narration and without this experimental sound collage synthesizer organ score, the oldest craft retains its connection with Sika's earliest film in spirit, if not form. Here, black and white static shots of hands kneading clay, wool being combed in preparation for the loom, and other folk activities recall again the early 20th century ethnographic photography and Klitschka's loving embrace of the traditional way of life still preserved in remote hamlets in the Tatra and Fatra mountains. As a product of normalization, however, the oldest craft carefully avoids even gingerly touching on taboo subjects such as Slovak autonomy or economic reform, preferring to focus on areas more traditionally labeled the province of Slovaks, wood carving, ceramics, the uh, production of Uh, unlike Water and Labor, the precise lack of avant-garde techniques in this particular film revealed the regime's growing sense that Slovak attempts to assert an artistic voice beyond the bendowing traditionalism favored by Klitschka and others was alienating. While the themes could be as Slovak as before, the treatment of them needed to be as rigid and unyielding as the wooden carvings which the documentary is so celebrated, in essence reducing the often fluid and volatile conversation regarding Slovak identity a nature preserved for a disappearing mode of living made obsolete by socialist progress. The final phenomenon I wish to discuss in this essay is the short-lived, though valiant effort to use the documentary form as a means to critique and protest in Slovakia. Although other filmmakers attempted to register their disapproval of the heavy-handed control imposed by the normalization government, few attempted to assert these differences in their work for fear of reprisal, and certainly none engaged in such a wholesale attempt to rebel and disrupt as Dushan Hanak. Hanak emerged from, the, emerged from the 1960s as one of Slovakia's most provocative and interesting young talents. His early films, such as 1964's Old Shatterhand, Prishel Kanam, Old Shatterhand Came to Us, explored the surreal aspects of life in Bratislava and elsewhere, melding avant-garde techniques, montage, and uh, sound collage, and art, uh, sorry, uh, impressionistic sensibilities with a growing sense of the Slovak authorial voice. His outspoken interviews in the press, along with his uncompromising films, led Hanak to be proclaimed in the press as one of those, the three of uh, leading lights of the Slovak young wave, a term as we've seen he thoroughly despised. Although his feature film 1962 was condemned by the Soviet-backed government in the wake of the 1968 invasion, a few years later, Hanak was given a chance to redeem himself politically through a, the comparatively safe avenue of documentary filmmaking. Allowed to collaborate with the celebra uh, celebrated ethnographic photographer of his choice, the authorities seemed to believe that the subject matter would temper Hanak's provocation. The resulting film, 1972's uh, Obrazi Stari Sveta, Pictures of the Old World, uh, sh both shocked the censors and titillated the critics with its blunt, oftentimes poetic examination of hardships and deprivation in rural Slovakia. And Nick, uh, sorry to wrap up. Wrapping up, okay, um, I'll blow through this super quick. Um, so Hanak's documentary is based on a collaboration with Bakhti Matinček, who is this photographer, uh, who specialized in these ethnic scenes. Uh, this is from the mid to late 60s, this is also from the 60s, uh, showing a, a land that sort of got eclipsed by socialist paradise. Um, the film itself, uh, speaking quickly, is a series of interviews with people living in these isolated villages uh, whose lives have been completely bypassed by communist progress. They're often deformed, uh, crippled, insane alcoholics, uh, utterly bereft of health and family. Uh, in one particularly famous scene, this gentleman here is a shepherd who's been thrown out of his house. He's pulling out from his jacket newspapers, which he uses to insulate himself in the, the cold highlands, uh, but also through which he has learned of the space race and proceeds to monologue extensively 
on the triumphs of Gagarin and the US astronauts which have appeared on the moon and how technology will take us all to some stars circling around the galaxy. Uh, however, he's completely removed from any sort of socialist progress. He's still living much as Slovaks did centuries ago. And a similar scene, this division is again repeated, this time with an old man who is uh, trying to sell his eggs in a marketplace in Falls. And uh, is then haggled almost to, to death by the denizens of the city, revealing that there's not even a, a sense of Slovak unity anymore. That in the city, things, people are trying to look out for themselves as much as possible. Uh, predictably so, the film was banned almost immediately. Uh, although it received great reviews by critics who had seen it, one of its few advanced screenings, it was originally supposed to screen on Czechoslovak television, uh, the film was shelved until 1988. It was not allowed to be seen. Uh, Hanak didn't work until 1980. But when it was revived in 1988 and allowed to be shown abroad, it immediately began winning awards. Uh, in 2000, they voted it the best Slovak film of all time um, by the Slovak Academy of Language. So uh, just to quickly identify the problem, uh, I know that I'm running out of time. Uh, I want to quote the Czech uh, film historian theorist uh, because she correctly identifies one of the problems of trying to use documentary film as a, as a uh, protest. Uh, the 1960s for documents were dominated by regulation, not strict rules. Hence, it was possible to use experimentation to find new angles and to approach the real and the everyday through the difference and the extreme. In contrast, the 1970s and 80s, it was no longer suffice that the norm was made an inner part of the rotting system. The norm was now much more carefully declared, required, and controlled. In essence, Hanak, in choosing to use this avant-garde method, is creating, uh, through the pictures of the old world, a formalist protest, uh, one that is ultimately futile. Because, as, we, as I told you, he gets uh, thoroughly done. So in, in, in wrapping up, really quickly, the documentary films in this era do three things. They establish Slovakia as a part of a Czechoslovak state, but different. They work with this photographic, ethnographic aesthetic, which becomes incredibly prevalent in films even after in the 1980s and 90s. And finally, they also prove to be the last hill upon which Slovak resistance to normalization sort of dies in some natural way. So thank you, sorry for going over.